Welcome to everyone from all over the UK. You can see some uh, clinicians in there from Ireland and some far visitors from Canada, Nigeria, Qatar, and someone claims to be on holiday in the Cape Verde Islands, so we're not speaking to them, obviously. Um, so, uh, yeah, some questions coming in there already. Uh, so let's, uh, <laughs> someone's putting in, uh, yeah, things that we might uh, want to, might be in my presentation, making guesses. Well, I think um, there was uh, a number of things to talk about in this presentation. So what we're going to do is uh, make a start and uh, see where it takes us. So what am I on about? Well, we all know that uh, in pre-hospital care as a whole, it usually takes us around 10 years to uh, introduce anything new. Uh, also, one signing in from Spain there, very nice. In the Philippines, we are very international tonight. Um, so, yeah, uh, it takes us about 10 years to introduce anything new. Uh, and we think that's really slow, but actually, if you look sometimes at uh, hospital practice, it's actually quite quick. Um, I think there was a study done in the US about how long it took to introduce uh, new uh, ALS guidelines. Uh, and the study, the paper was around um, when new ALS guidelines, or ACLS as they call it in the US, when new ACS guidelines are introduced in the, uh, in the US, how many years does it take for 50% of the hospitals to adopt them? And I think it was somewhere around the three-year mark. So three years after they were uh, published, only 50% of uh, hospitals had adopted the new resuscitation guidelines. So I think uh, if, that's a, if that's a wider picture, then you know uh, maybe we're not quite as slow as we think we are. One of the problems we have, of course, though, is that it takes us quite a long time to introduce new things. It takes us even longer to get rid of them. Yeah, so uh, we are beholden to dogma and things that we you know can't get rid of or ideas that we're stuck on uh you know which uh can take some getting rid of uh and i think over the last sort of 10 years or so we have cleared out a lot of old dogma uh and we got better at bringing in uh things that are only based on evidence but there's still a number of practices that persist in in different services uh, and this is mostly reflecting on UK practice. So I will try and internationalize some of it well as, as we go along. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, and things we really should be mindful about uh, and, and looking to see if we can change uh, where possible to optimize our care and to maximize our bandwidth. Uh, and sometimes to minimize cost, you know, we have to accept that, you know, the delivery of uh, pre-hospital care has a, you know, a finite budget. Uh, and so in order to maximize that budget, then things that take up time or money means we don't spend that time or money on something else. You know, so I think there is, a, you know, a reason why we shouldn't do things because we could be doing something else that's more meaningful for the patient. So uh, as I started to sort of uh, had an idea some months back about this presentation, I thought it would be a really good idea. And as I started to research it, I suddenly realized that there wasn't enough letters in the alphabet and there was lots of things that I wanted to put in there. So I had to uh, really drill down into some of it and, uh, and come up with some things that, uh, that meant something. Uh, and some of the things that people are suggesting, yeah, people have put cervical collars in. I think we've probably dealt with that one. And uh, yeah, we pretend they don't exist. Uh, but all the suggestions in here are not always my opinion, but I hear to promote discussion. So don't shoot the messenger. You know, uh, this talk is designed to promote discussion you know not to be well jamie says you know we shouldn't do this you know uh so therefore you know we shouldn't do it it's here to sort of make us more mindful and thinking about what we do so let's see where it takes us now i apologize for any intentional manipulation to fill the alphabet because some letters were trickier than others but i think in the end i pretty much got there but there might be one or two towards the end when we get to the tricky letters so where do we start So if we're going to start with A, yeah, then uh, A uh, would clearly be ambulance. And they say, well, what, you know, why is an ambulance meaningless? But it's not about an ambulance. It's about the delivery of services. Yeah, we have a uh, an ambulance service generally in the UK that's delivered around a 1970s model, um, but trying to meet 2020 demand. Yeah, we 
And as demand has increased, we've just added more ambulances, thinking that will manage the demand and the demand continues to outstrip to strip the number of ambulances. What we haven't really ever considered in the, in, in the UK is a complete remodel of how we deliver ambulance services. Ambulance services are no longer just a, an emergency service for life-threatening emergencies, but a multifactorial caregiver uh, and all the other stuff we're very much aware of. Uh, and we can't continue to address that by keeping adding more ambulances uh, you know, that are manned by, uh, if, if a paramedic crew, I would say paramedics are almost the ultimate generalist in, in all forms of medicine. I don't think any other branch of medicine, emergency medicine is probably the closest. Uh, GPs have a huge, you know, scope, but don't do so much emergency medicine. So I think, you know, if, if you're looking at the, the person, the, the, the branch of medicine that does the most generalism, it's probably paramedics. Um, the other thing, we, we have tinkered with specialist things, you know, and specialist resources. Um, but it, often it is just, you know, like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, we, we build specialist resources um, to try and manage this demand that are, you know, um, fairly sort of uh, insignificant in the bigger picture. You know, I think I tried to write a description of it and it was sort of around our sort of, you know, our multi-award winning. I remember, remember letter P when we get to that. You know, full service for those aged 70 to 71 with diabetic foot ulcers, left foot only, sees two patients a week in a 10 square mile radius and only costs a million pounds a year. And we're quite good at that. We're quite good at building, you know, uh, specialist services that sound good and win awards, but actually have almost no impact on the delivery of uh, pre-hospital care. I'm sure they do for the patients that they see, but looking at the bigger picture, the volume of patients, the impact is very little. The other thing about you know, uh, our delivery in the UK is the model of having the government targets to have a paramedic on every ambulance. Now, I know we don't achieve that currently uh, in many areas, uh, but is it necessary? I think when you look at other places abroad that use a more two-tiered system of sort of BLS and ALS ambulances and so on and dispatching them appropriately, actually, there probably is something in that. You know, uh, about having a paramedic on, amb on every ambulance although they're not there for their sort of life-saving interventions, they're there for their knowledge. It means that they don't get to practice things very much uh, outside of urgent care. So there probably is a model where we should think about how we how we deliver pre-hospital care in the greater picture. Uh, but we tend to worry about other things uh, way too much. Uh, we look at the small details, you know, not, not the bigger picture. Uh, B is a really easy one. If you've ever been on one of our airway courses, this is a regular rant. I think I had this rant today. Um, you know, on day one of an airway course, uh, and uh, yeah, that's people putting bacterial airway filters in a pre hospital disposable airway circuit. You know, uh, we don't mind about the bacteria because we don't wash the BVMs and put them back in the ambulance, they're throwaway. What should be in the airway circuit and what's used in the airway circuit everywhere else is an HME filter, uh, but still, persistently, we have a good number of ambulance services that. Uh, buy and uh, promote the use of bacterial filters without any understanding of the difference. Uh, having ones also that have got the little port on the side there, see the little green cap, that could be both on HMEs and bacterial filters. Uh, it's generally an entidal line, it's used in hospital uh, where the entidal line is attached to it to, to sample from there. Uh, and there is a number of untowards incidents uh, around the loss of ventilation from that cap being open uh, unwillingly. So uh, we probably should uh, have a consideration for the kit we buy. And I think some, some of that is a consequence of kit purchase um, by the unknowing. Yeah, so having people that are uh, non-clinical stuff um, being in charge of kit. So uh, I think there's a real marker there for that. C, uh, yeah, is clearly cardiac arrest drugs. You know, the resource council themselves say, we don't really have any evidence for the use of adrenaline and amiodarone in cardiac arrest. All the big international trials show the same, uh, but we're going to carry on giving them for now while we do more research. Uh, and I understand it's a huge step for them to withdraw these uh, medications from cardiac arrest, uh, particularly as adrenaline in the studies show a large increase in ROSC, but no, in, no real increase in survival. So if we stopped giving them, our ROSC rate would drop dramatically, but our survival rate probably wouldn't change at all. And I think um, so. That's a, that's a very major step for, uh, for a system to undertake. I think what it should do, though, is reflect upon us the priority of these medications. Yeah, we see um, that, you know, uh, people are very, you know, concerned about 
giving the medications you know exactly in line with the protocol and that may be overriding other stuff that's probably more important in cardiac arrest it's about priority setting these diesel yeah you know um here, here the word diesel being used in education people saying you know oh you know what's, what's the treatment for this patient it's diesel uh, diesel's not a medication yeah diesel is something that runs the ambulances until they run an electric well, that's fine because then they just run out of battery before they get to the hospital uh but uh you know diesel's not a medication you know momentum with appropriate care is not diesel yeah diesel is suggestive of we're going to chuck them in the ambulance and head to hospital fast driver yeah uh, it's like sort of 1970s um carry on sort of uh, ambulance driving yeah scoop and run to an inappropriate hospital is just taking the patient to another place they can't get the care they need like they couldn't in the patient's home yeah so you know really important uh that uh you know uh, we use appropriate mentum and care and don't use these sort of antiquated dogmatic terms that suggest that actually just speed in itself you know uh, in in many things and there is things where that is important. Yeah, where timely arrival at the right hospital is important. Yeah, but that isn't diesel as a medication. Yeah, it is part of a bigger picture. And sometimes we hear that being talked of as, you know, the treatment for this. Uh, is, you know, uh, reflective of a couple of things that's going to come up, which is, you know, ECGs for all, you know, especially for discharge of care, you know, uh, you know, where uh, the patient's got a hurty ankle or something like that, and we see, you know, the patient's had a 12 ECG, et cetera. And yes, you might pick up some incidental findings. But there's a huge amount of cost in this. You know, um, not clinically indicated assessments cost time and money and actually place the patient at risk of admission that they probably didn't need, particularly in the elderly. Yeah, if you find something, it's then quite hard to ignore it. Yeah, and is, is it actually clinically meaningful at that time or is it something that can lead to a, another referral or whatever? You know, I think generally, you know, there's not many patients who have gone to their GP complaining about their tennis elbow and had a 12 ECG. Yeah, so I think we need to be meaningful about our inter uh, interventions. And I understand that's often driven by, you know, um, mandatory paperwork and, uh, and standards where, uh, you know, uh, people are looking at very, very low risk discharge. But it does have a risk, you know, it has a risk in the time and money that's spent on these things that isn't then available for something else. And as I said earlier, you know, if we only have a finite budget, then, you know, there, there's a risk to every single intervention we do that isn't clinically indicated. And the fact it's eating some of that budget. Uh, F couldn't be P, so, you know, F ended up being peak flow meters. Yeah, so, you know, um, uh, peak flow meters uh, are fairly unique to the UK in the European perspective. You know, uh, not many other places have them on ambulances uh, that I've been aware of. We're working lots of different places in Europe. Uh, during COVID, uh, they were mostly taken away because they were deemed to be an aerosol generating procedure and they weren't disposable. So they were taken off ambulances in many regions. Uh, and now they appear to be uh, reappearing. But as during COVID, then as asthmatics weren't dropping dead everywhere, then uh, maybe we don't need them. And we have other in, uh, other meaningful measurements for these patients, including end tidal CO2. Uh, but again, you know, sometimes we have to learn when to say no. Uh, G is glucose, yeah. And obviously that's capillary blood glucose, not BM, because uh, BM is not a clinical intervention. Yeah, we have to remember that these units, uh, you know, they're calibrated for finger use only. Um, they are, uh, again, not a thing for everyone. Uh, you know, what is the indication for a, you know, capillary blood glucose in a patient who's fully alert with no medical history? And yet we routinely see it being done, you know, as a, as, as a root intervention. I can't discharge this patient with a hurdy ankle until I've done their blood glucose. It's like, what for? Yeah, what is the, what is the meaning of... You know, this intervention is placing the patient at risk of, you know, a, you know, a invasive procedure with minimal risk, appreciably, but an infection risk. Uh, and again, comes back to that point of costing time and money. Yeah, the sticks are really expensive. Yeah, and uh, and what what does it mean clinically? Uh, also, it being used in other settings, like like during cardiac arrest. 
Yeah, you know, then uh, we shouldn't be surprised if their blood glucose is low. If they've got no circulation, they've eaten all their all, all their glucose up, um, and rarely a reversible cause. So again, it's that yeah, meaningful. You know, why why are we doing this? Not because we do it for every patient. Um, H is hand gel. Yeah, uh, because uh, we have lots of hand gel uh, absolutely everywhere. Yeah, which when it was alcohol was a huge fire risk. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got lots of hand gel everywhere. Uh, and yet, obviously, the ideal thing is hand washing. And hand washing is the ideal thing. We know hand washing is really good. You should wash your hands, you know, as much as possible. If you're in hospital, you wash your hands all the time. And uh, if anyone from my PC really annoys me, then I like to lead them down the garden path and talk about how hand washing is really good or whatever. And then ask them why we don't have sinks on the ambulance. Yeah, uh, they go can't have a sink on an ambulance like yeah it can when the bt man comes to my house to install my phone line he's got a sink on his van that's the thing on the right there hot and cold running water sink yeah why wouldn't you have a sink on your ambulance and then they usually find an excuse to leave the room yeah so you know um why can't we have hand washing yeah if hand washing is really good why can't we have hand washing on the ambulance i see no reason why not and in a world where every patient is transported to hospital where you can wash your hands and get there but in many uk ambulance services only 50% of patients are transported to hospital. So 50% of the time, an ambulance crew goes to a patient and then they've got some alcohol hand gel to rub themselves with uh, before they go to the next patient. So, you know, if IPC is that important, we should have hand washing. Uh, yeah, IV cannulas, yeah. Not that they're pointless. Yeah, that's not, that's not a pointless thing in itself. Yeah, we have a, we have a use for IV cannulas. Uh, but what is pointless is using IV cannulas for things they weren't meant for. Yeah, so needle chest decompression or needle crike. Yeah, they weren't made for it. They're not approved for it. They've never been tested for it. You'll find no evidence that they work in many things like that. Yeah, so, you know, we need to be uh, re really careful about how we use things and why we use them for that reason. And the other thing that always annoys me is, why do we have so many sizes of cannula? Yeah, why in an ambulance do we need five or six sizes of cannula? What's wrong with small, medium, large? Well, maybe what's wrong with medium, but... You know, um, again, it's cost, you know, and sometimes we have some appalling safety cannulas. Uh, and I'm sure generally we can be trusted with sharp things. We're trusted with lots of stuff. Yeah, but good safety cannulas, some of them are all right. But, you know, as a whole, it's something that's been uh, not thought about very much. We have way too much stuff on ambulances, like multiple sizes of things we just don't need. And then not sizes of other things we do need. Uh, considering J, then uh, J, I put jewels in. Yeah, just for, for a meaningful bit of discussion. Yeah, so uh, we know that, you know, uh, we're talking about defibrillation. The setting on our defibrillator is based in joules. Yeah. Uh, but actually, if you speak to people about defibrillation and the science of defibrillation, then, uh, you know, joules is the amount of energy delivered. It doesn't actually affect, isn't actually what makes the patient defibrillate. Yeah, they're defibrillated by amps. Yeah, so we really should have an amp setting. Yeah, but uh, uh, joules is part of the equation, but it depends on what resistance you have. Yeah, uh, and people think that more joules is better. But it also depends on the waveform. Yeah, as you can see there, there's some examples there of different monitors, generally not necessarily ones always used pre-hospitally. Uh, but it's a good little graph I found. You know, so, uh, you know, large amounts of joules does not necessarily mean large amounts of amps. Yeah, because it's dependent on the resistance of the patient, i.e. how thick they are. I mean, not thick as in stupid, but thick as in, you know, uh, body mass and, and density. Uh, and also uh, uh, the delivery waveform uh, of the shock, you know, so uh, more power doesn't necessarily mean, uh, in joules, doesn't necessarily mean more defibrillation. So I think that's an important thing that we should understand. Coming around to K, now I resisted putting collars in here. Yeah, because uh, I think we've, uh, we've done collars, but I thought I would add in KEDS. Yeah, um, you know, a device that has no cleaning, clinically uh, indication on, a, on an ambulance. Yeah, yeah we're going to, going to talk a little bit about extrication later. If you want a patient extricated rapidly, you won't be using a KED. And if you want an extricate, a patient extricated slowly, you won't be using a KED. So when would you use a KED? Yeah, and, and in the, in the uh, motion studies that were done, I think in uh, Cork or uh, somewhere like that, 
and they stuck all the motion sensors all over real people and extricated them using all you know devices and cut cars up and things. Uh, Ked caused mo more movement to the spine than uh, self extrication. So I think we can safely say uh, that we probably shouldn't uh, be using Keds, and I know many ambulance services have taken them away. We can't say, though, that KEDs don't have a purpose. The reason for the lower picture is uh, that KEDs enable you to get the best value out of the skip that you've bought to put all the collars in. Because the collars are only fill it halfway up. So you can achieve maximum value uh, by filling it to the top with all your KEDs. L was for lifts. Uh, and it's not lifts itself, because lifts are yeah can be a nuisance indeed uh, if, you, if you work some over lots of high-rise buildings, which luckily I don't. Um, but uh, it, was re it was to reflect things that ambulance services do. We complain about our workload and you know our call volume and we're struggling to do this and struggling to meet that target. And yet the ambulance service never says no to anybody. Yeah, ever. Yeah, so, you know, lift only calls, patient says they're uninjured. Uh, concern for welfare, alarm activations, fall alarms, all this stuff is generating loads and loads and loads of calls. And everyone just says, ring the ambulance service. Yeah, and I'm not sure how that can persist forever without us ever saying no. The example I always use in education is, you know, uh, you rang the police uh, and said, uh, I've lost my cat. Yeah, then uh, the police would say, stop bothering us, we ring again, we'll come around and we'll arrest you. If you ring the fire service now, they'll say, ring the RSPCA. If you ring the ambulance service, they'll send you an ambulance in case you don't actually have a cat, but you have a mental health problem and you're imagining you have a cat. Yeah, and that's a, you know, that is a, a, a dispatch model uh, that, you know, just can't persist forever because we can't just keep saying yes to everybody. Yeah, at some point we have to stand up and say, no, unless we have lots of money for a commission service. We just can't keep going to everything forever when the other services are saying no. You know, they're saying, no, we won't do it. Uh, M is quite controversial to some people. Yeah. Uh, M stands for Mercedes box ambulances. Yeah. I've worked on every type of ambulance there is. You know, Mercedes box ambulances, van conversions of all different types, four by four ambulances, uh, and ambulances in many par other parts of the world as well. And, uh, you know, I know here people very much like their Mercedes box ambulances. Now, if they like driving a Mercedes because it drives well, I don't mind that at all. Yeah, uh, and you could easily use a Mercedes van. Probably the most widely used ambulance across Europe is a Mercedes medium van, medium length van, yeah, van conversion. So you get the driver Mercedes, uh, but in a, a van conversion. Uh, and as much as people like box body ambulances, Mercedes being the most, the biggest example, as much as people like box body ambulances, I've never been on scene with a critically unwell patient and a backup ambulance has arrived and I've gone, oh, it's a van conversion, the patient's going to die. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, it doesn't have any clinical meaning to the patient surviving. No one has the coroner ever gone, well, the patient died because they were put in a fiat. Yeah, it's not a real thing. Yeah, they have no clinical meaning. If you like them, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. The problem is they're very expensive. Yeah, around 100. Fifty thousand pounds per ambulance is custom built box body ambulances yeah and i think our money could probably be better spent i think uh, you know more lives would be saved by a seventy-five thousand pound ambulance with seventy-five thousand pounds of extra kit training yeah um now i know the money probably wouldn't be spent that way but i can dream yeah so i think we should just bear in mind what's clinically meaningful versus what we like yeah i'd like a bentley ambulance but apparently i can't have one uh, yeah, N had to be NHS pathways. Yeah, a triage system that we made because um, we used a different triage system and we changed to NHS pathways. Um, what's wrong with the NHS pathways? I think as a whole, uh, it uh, you know isn't very good at identifying non-university patients. But also, in my experience of uh, working in um, uh, some urgent care settings where. Uh, the patients are also, uh, like the antivirus GPs, where patients are also triaged by pathways. It isn't that good at also recognising patients that are very sick, and a lot of patients will turn up in the wrong place there as well. People used to turn up, you know, uh, having a stroke, you know, at the, uh, at the antivirus GPs and things. You know, so, um, you know, I think uh, it's not a great triage system, and it probably works better for uh, 
111 uh, sort of uh, 111 side and urgent care isn't great uh, at triaging uh, emergency stuff, I don't think. Uh, and we know it's very risk averse. The trouble is, as we mentioned earlier, you know, having no risk is fine as long as you have a finite, uh, you know, uh, infinite resources. Yeah, if you've got, you know, more ambulances than you have calls, then you can have a low risk as triage as you like. Yeah, but, you know, if you, uh, you don't have an unlimited amount of resources, then actually having a system that is very low risk is more risky because you end up uh, moving people to different places. I someone's complaining they can't hear me very well. I'm not quite sure why that is. I haven't moved my microphone. Try moving it a bit more. There we go. Um, I'm not sure entirely that replacing it with a very cheap system where you ask the patient how sick they are and send them a resource that way probably might not be better and uh, probably more reliable. But um, I think it's something that we're going to need to uh, work on eventually. Uh, O's for oxygen, but only for medium concentration masks. Yeah, I can't remember the last time on an ambulance I went, I really would like a medium concentration mask. Yeah, patients either have very small amounts of oxygen, probably through a nasal oxygen cannula, or very large amounts of oxygen, and mostly very large amounts of oxygen, or no oxygen at all. Yeah, and yeah, in some ambulances, you have a proliferation of mask types. There are absolutely loads of them, which take up space, money, time, uh, etc. Same theme. Uh, P, I love the picture, it's great. Yeah, uh, P is uh, pointless medals. Yeah, um, you know, uh, in services where you know uh, they have a terrible CQC rating and you know uh, poor performance figures, then uh, spending money on you know uh, award ceremonies in five star hotels and giving out loads of medals and trophies, you know, does seem slightly inappropriate uh, based on the performance of the service. Uh, and if you want to reward individuals, I suggest that perhaps staff would probably like a pay rise or a meal break, yeah, as opposed to um, some sort of glass trophy. Uh, Q is obviously the word that nobody is allowed to say. Yeah, so we had to mention that. Yeah, so nobody say the Q word. Uh, or also, if uh, some of our fine colleagues from heart are fast asleep, we have to keep that. R is RRV. Yeah, RRVs are a weird thing. Yeah, we never used to have RRVs in the UK. When I started in the ambulance service, RRVs didn't exist. And then they made an appearance and then they became ubiquitous. And there was ambulance services in the UK uh, that uh, had uh, more RRVs than ambulances uh, at some point. Yeah, and uh, wondered why they struggled. Yeah, so... You know, they're not particularly any more rapid nowadays. You know, in the days of ambulances being really slow, uh, you know, then there's not really any time difference. Um, they're uh, a good conveyance for a specialist resource. If you have a specialist single crude resource, then, uh, you know, a car SUV based vehicle uh, might be a great thing. Um, but otherwise, it's probably just stopping a clock somewhere. Yeah, they are unheard of in most of the rest of the world. Yeah, not many other places has the proliferation of rapid response vehicles we had. I appreciate now they are reduced tremendously in some services. The other argument is about resourcing. Yeah, we'll send a paramedic to this job and, uh, you know, the paramedic can discharge the patient on scene. Uh, and that'd be cheaper because we're only sending one person. But actually, if you sit and drill down to do it, I don't, I'm not sure it entirely works that way. Um, because if your discharge rate is only 50%, are you sending the paramedic to generalist things rather than as a specialist resource? Then 50% of the time, uh, the paramedic will discharge them on scene. But the other 50% of the time, they want an ambulance. And now you've sent two resources to that job and three people. So all of a sudden, it doesn't work out cheaper. Uh, the other thing is that a double crew uh, can probably more safely and, discharge, and quickly discharge a patient on scene because they can do more stuff simultaneously. So actually, I think if you sat and work it out, as some services have, then a sort of standardized RRV, um, you know, is, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, a thing that could be clinically good. Uh, S is spinal immobilization. Yeah, uh, as a whole, yeah, regardless of the device, it's a great collar picture, isn't it? I love a great collar picture. Yeah, we usually have to rely on the Olympics to produce uh, pictures of such quality. Uh, but I found this one on the internet somewhere. 
Yeah, I have uh, this uh, collar that doesn't look like it's even touching the patient, does it? Uh, so uh, the uh, idea of spinal immobilization, uh, you know, is mostly theoretical anyway, but it seems like a good idea. But I think if uh, for anyone who wants to look more widely on this, then the uh, exit project, the Team Nutbeam exit project from the southwest of the UK, was a project that was done for the fire service. I'm sure many of you have seen it, read parts of it, etc. Yeah, these uh, are, you know, looking at one of the parts of the exit project is what value of spinal immobilization in patients that are in vehicles with life-threatening emergencies. Yeah, and, you know, does delayed extrication or waiting to extricate them in a more formal manner benefit these patients and it appears the evidence suggests it doesn't yeah so we have to balance the clinical need of the patient and their life-threatening emergency which probably won't be a spinal injury versus the time it would take to extricate them uh, in the traditional way yeah someone's put in a wish s have been suspension syncope yeah well if uh, anyone knew what suspension syndrome was, then uh, rather than an imaginary possible thing that someone once read about, then that might have helped. Uh, here's tympanic thermometers. Yeah, we never used to have thermometers on ambulances, you know, and then, uh, you know, tympanic thermometers came available. You know, are they of massive clinical use, particularly taking temperatures in everyone? Yeah, we know they're very prone to error. If you don't get them in the ear right, so a cardiac arrest not so long ago, someone stuck a tympanic in the patient's ear. I'm not a big fan of doing tim uh, temperatures in, in, in cardiac arrest, but they did it in front of me. You know, uh, I'd already put my hand on the patient and they were lovely and warm. And uh, they stuck it in the patient's ear and pressed the button and told me the temperature was 24.2. I'm like, are you sure? The patient's really warm. Yes. Yeah. And I took it again and they were 36 point something. They just didn't have it in their ear properly. Yeah, uh, and that could have really changed the you know the clinical setting for that patient if someone had believed that temperature rather than checking it again or having touched the patient. Most of the ones we have won't measure low temperatures. They're entirely in, they're made for fever. They won't measure low temperatures. They're not accurate in anyone who's wet. So uh, anyone who's wet in any way, including the very sweaty, it will measure the sweat temperature or the water surface temperature in your ear rather than tympanic membrane. If you've been in water and your waters are full of ear. You know, uh, and unless the patient is profoundly hypothermic, uh, and most of the thermometers we have won't measure the temperatures where it changes the ALS protocol, then, you know, it's going to be a best guess by touching the patient if they're ice cold, because most of the temperatures don't go anywhere. Thermometers don't go anywhere near that. Um, so, yeah, formal measurement is going to require the right equipment, some form of more invasive temperature monument. You would be a popular one, yeah. Uh, you is uh, UK ambulance service uniform, yeah. A uh, a fine quality thing made by the cheapest bidder, yeah. Uh, it offers uh, almost no IPC protection, not being coated in anything that provides protection. Uh, we now have more options in the form of jackets and things, so it's slightly more temperature sensitive than it used to be. But my main concern is that it has no PPE element. We spend a lot of time out on the in roads and all that sort of thing and in lots of different places and in hazardous places and uh you know uh a dark green uniform is clearly the safest and most sensible thing you'd want to wear at night time yeah without having to wear your high-vis jacket all the time we look at other ambulance services particularly the european ambulance services they have brightly colored uniform uh with reflective stuff on it and i really wonder why ours has to just look smart why can't it be safer V, we had to be slightly clever and change it to ventilation. Yeah, another one of my favorite rants on our airway and, and whatever courses uh, is, uh, you know, uh, bag valve masks. Yeah, great piece of kit. Absolutely nothing wrong with them at all. But why are they 15 to 1600 mils? Uh, we know it's a throwback to the year 2000 guidelines at 15 mils a kilo of ventilation. Times the maximum ideal body weight of a human being, so, you know, uh, 100 kilos gives you 1,500 mils. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, uh, but now we know we want to ventilate at 6 mils a kilo, so we only need a 600 mil BVM as the sort of maximum, maybe plus a bit, you know, uh, but uh, we definitely don't need 15 or 1,600 mils. And well, my question normally is, why do the manufacturers still make them? And the answer probably is because we still buy them. Yeah. 
why why we have to spend our time teaching people to ventilate less out of a really big bag i really don't understand yeah uh, but we're sort of stuck with them it seems at the moment let me just check on the time we're doing very nicely we're almost there we're at v uh yeah w is water yeah and why is water mean intervention well it's there to represent fluids yeah um you know we have fluids on the ambulance um you know and maybe we've learned something from some of the ongoing trials like refill is at small volumes of normal saline so you don't seem to do any harm in trauma uh you know more than small volumes of blood because you don't get the advantages or disadvantages of either um but at least we know they should be at a decent temperature uh and in many places we no longer have any way of warming fluids it's been really cold recently and the fluids in the ambulance are ice cold you know i don't care if that's blood or saline or whatever it should be going into patients you know, at body temperature, if the patient's a trauma patient, um, I really can't see why that's so difficult to deal with. X, well, here I might have manipulated the, the alphabet a little bit. I'm ever so sorry. Yeah, so someone there says Scottish Ambulance Service has fluid warmers. Well done, the Scottish Ambulance Service. Yeah, absolutely. It should, it should be the way. We used to have them. They got taken away. No idea why. Yeah, it's been some uh, recent papers re uh, as well that look at like um, does warming fluids harm them, and they've suggested that it doesn't. Yeah, actually, they can be uh, kept warm for quite a long time. Uh, yeah, X uh, and X is uh, clinical backup for extrication. Yeah, we hear that quite a lot. Can I back up for extrication? Well, what sort of extrication backup do you want? Yeah, do you need clinical help or do you need people to carry someone down the stairs? And they're two different things. Yeah, and in a finite resource, you know, uh, utilizing another paramedic crew when we could be using a different resource, you know, to back someone up to help carry someone down the stairs, probably probably isn't a very sensible idea. Yeah, we should be maybe using other resources uh, to do that um, because uh, you know, if you want clinical help, absolutely. But if you just want someone to carry someone down the stairs, well, that's probably not a good use of the clinical resources that we have. But we still see that quite a lot as a model. Uh, onto why, yeah, well, uh, again, if you've been on one of our airway courses, uh, you'll understand our uh, dislove of uh, the Yanka a couple of people commenting they have uh, dedicated vehicles for help or a fire service, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Yanka suction catheter, yeah, uh, invented by Dr. Sidney Yanka um, for suctioning capillary blood uh, from tonsillectomies. Yeah, never made for airway clearance, has a stupid hole in it, uh, blocks all the time, uh, and is entirely unfit for purpose. And yet, for some reason, we just keep buying them that I can't explain when there is perfectly good alternatives that actually work as a suction catheter. And there's more than one brand of that, but uh, yeah, someone's mentioned the Jacanto catheter, which is just superb yeah, and is a world of difference. Yeah, so I think that comes back to people buying stuff that they don't particularly understand what they're buying they're just told to buy a suction catheter and finally we get to z in all the things we wanted to talk about yeah uh and uh z uh represents zebras yeah and the problem is in order to manage the resources that we have and provide good care to the patients who really really need our help then we need to take some risk yeah, other other parts of healthcare take far more risk than we're willing to take. Yeah, and the problem is when we're looking for a zebra in a world of horses, we expose the horses to enormous risk, and that's uh, that's something that uh, you know we're currently uh, really struggling with. With such finite resources, we have to accept there is zebras, but if we spend all our time looking for them, the horses really suffer. So, yeah, you know, uh, one of the things we need to learn is that, you know, um, you know, we can't stick with dogma. We need to fight dogma. We need to change things. You know, and we've changed a lot, but I think we're still quite a long way to go. I think professionally we've changed enormously, but making the stuff and equipment and things we're expected to do change um you know uh you know really needs to be challenged more and more and we need more sort of thinking clinical people we're now a very educated profession uh, and we need to be able to use that to drive change in some of these things that you know have just been there forever 